Hi, how are you, Anna? Great, you great. Fantastic. Great. All right, we got a full house today, so this is wonderful. Um, I'm going to share the. Uh, I'm going to share the agenda again. Um, give me a second. Okay, and everyone see that? And someone needs is. Uh. Yes. All right. Oh. Okay, can everybody see the agenda that I've posted here? Yep. Yes. All right, fantastic. So, so I think we want to start with the um, just the uh, uh, kind of like do the conference overview. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that because I think most of you on this call were there, so uh, you'll be able to quickly verify whether what I'm saying is true. Um, so there was a survey link that went out today. Um, please uh, respond to that at your earliest convenience. Uh, I've seen some of you already have, so thank you to those that have, and those who have not, uh, please do so soon. Uh, the more responses we get, the, uh, the better we can make next year's conference. Um, so that's very really good. Um, as far as overall impressions, uh, and I'll leave time at the very end for a Q and A if you can reach out, but I thought the conference was really good. I was impressed by kind of the, the positive uh, vibe that uh, I think I, think I was impressed by the enthusiasm. Uh, I thought it was a really nice way to spend time with three, 300 of my closest friends. Uh, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Um, there, there are definitely places on the survey where you can send feedback about conference content, speakers, how it's structured. There are also some questions about the community itself, like how it's structured, please um, answer them fully and honestly so that we can uh, we can make the open edX community bigger and better than whatever. Um, all right, so I think that's really all I wanted to say about the conference. Um, if you guys want to share your thoughts, please do on the, do on the survey, or uh, you can also discuss it. You can also discuss it on the, on the Slack channel or the mailing list uh, and get feedback to us that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I hope to hear from uh, a bunch of you. All right, so um, you still hear background noise from someone. I don't know. Yeah, it's like we now have. Wait, what? I hear confusion. <laughs> I hear confusion in a room full of people trying to get something set up. Uh, so we'll have to see how that, how that goes. Um, Ned, are you there? Hang on. That's always there. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> uh, okay, because someone. Uh, can, can you? Yep. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah. Was someone trying to speak? Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Software Professionals Try to Make Video Conferencing Work. <laughs> That's kind of what I, I thought. <laughs> All right, so what's, uh, what's going on over there? Uh, do you want me to talk about Hawthorne in particular? Yes, please. Okay, so the Hawthorne release, we're still waiting for a few things to land. We um, have a contribution to uh, make our OAuth scopes implementation work, and we want to get that landed. Um, we currently have some problems with our Facebook integration that is, are getting fixed and so we need to get that landed. Those okay. are the two things we're waiting on. There are some other uh, pull requests that people have said they want to get into Hawthorne that seems to be a bit stuck in the edX review. We're going to try to get those uh, expedited to get them in. Uh, I don't know that I can promise that they'll get in, but we are going to try really hard. I think we'll be able to cut the Hawthorne master branches perhaps by the end of next week, but we need to see how those, those, uh, the OS scopes work and the Facebook fixes work uh, progress. Cool. One okay. thing we could really use help with, as always, is testing of the release candidate when it comes out. And what that means is quickly get the software onto your machines, assess how it's working for you, and then give us actionable reports of problems that you find. 
Um, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to track those reports, but the most important thing is for you to give us uh, assessments of how it's going for you, including it's going great. Like you don't have to have a bug report. You can just tell us everything is perfect. That's, I love those. Give me more of those. Um, but sort of that's where Hawthorne stands right now. Any questions about that? Are there any pull requests or issues people need to review or help out with at the moment, other than the two things you mentioned? Um, so there is a Hawthorne wiki page. That's exactly what I was looking for. Okay. Right, and we can put a link to that into this uh, agenda as part of the record. Um, on that page are links to pull requests. Um, the ones that have already been merged have a strike through them. Um, the ones that have not been merged are just sitting there as links. If you are interested to help out, you can take a look at those pull requests. Um, any review by anyone on a pull request is helpful to getting the pull request merged because if you find something that you think is an issue, uh, uh, raising it soon to the author is better than waiting for edX to range it, we'll raise it to the author. So although you may not be a person who can merge pull requests, everyone can review pull requests. Okay. All right, cool. Um, I'm going to find, I'm looking for that, that page. I'll post it into the agenda as soon as I can, uh, as soon as I can locate it. Uh, if somebody else has it, feel free to update the agenda with that. Uh, all right, thank you, Ned. Any, uh, any questions briefly uh, on Hawthorne before we go forward? One more, it's going twice. All right. Uh, cool. By the way, there's a record number of participants. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay, Namisha, pull requests and OEPs. What yeah. you got? Thank you. <laughs> that was neat. <laughs> Wasn't it? Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. I think um, I think there are two microphones what? in the room where you are, so one of them has to be. Okay, I did. Can you guys hear me now? I can hear you. Just okay, cool. Thank you. So, um, yeah, uh, I'll go this, through this very quickly, but um, we have a, a, a record number of OAPs actually that are also um, upcoming and in progress. Uh, so Robert Raposa, along with Alex at edX, they just recently merged the. Uh, caching and Django OLAP. You guys can take a look and it gives you some guidelines on um, what what we currently have in our system for how we're caching things, as well as some direction of where we'd like to go with caching in a two-tiered way in, 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 in Django. Uh, under review right now, Greg Sham um, has an OLAP for deprecation and removal that is under review right now. We would love to get more um, input on that from the community. Omar has given his uh, uh, his review of it from AppSembler. It would be great to have other people also just take a, a, a look at that. If there are questions, and I don't know if we have time today, but at some point um, we could have a synchronous conversation about it if, if, um, if there is more uh, conversation to be had there. The Block Store OAP, uh, Braden's about to talk about Block Store in a few minutes, so I won't get too much into it, but Block Store is also under review and uh, Peter Princh from MIT is the arbiter for that. Uh, the developer, uh, developer docs OEP, uh, Robert is working on that, uh, hopefully with Nate at AppSembler. So that would be great at that, that one. Please keep, keep an eye on it. That's an upcoming one. Uh, the theming OEP, Ari is gonna try to put, push that through as well. This would be just an initial, uh, initial approach to theming, uh, not necessarily how we're gonna override modules, but more about just theming uh, for uh, styling purposes. So that is uh, coming and along its way. There is an upcoming OEP on rate limiting. And finally, for OAuth scopes, that hasn't yet been written as an OEP, but uh, we do have uh, some things there that we design thoughts that we do want to put that in OEP form so the community can give inputs and so forth. So that's a quick update on OEPs and um, Definitely keep your eye out more on the OpenEdX proposals repo, and hopefully there's more to come there as well. Cool. We will, uh, in terms of APIs, uh, in case anyone had questions about that, we did talk about that at the OpenEdX conference. We had a great Birds of a Feather session on APIs and API strategy. Uh, we don't have that right now under works, but we're hoping that in about maybe four to five weeks or so later, then we'll start focusing more of our efforts on API and strategy there. And that too will come in the form of OEPs for people to review and contribute their thoughts on. So 
that's all I had, John, JM, about OAPs. Uh, I think for OSPRs, we have Braden who's going to share some that are coming from OpenCraft. Yeah? Cool. Braden, are you there? Yep. Excellent. Okay. Yep. Go for it. Uh, great. Can I share my screen to go over these things? Yeah, I'm going to stop my share. And then can you automatically share, or do I need to give you? I think I can. Just give me one second. Okay. All right, can you guys see the box? Yeah, there we go, we got it, thank you. Great, so I'm gonna quickly cover three things that OpenCraft has been working on or is working on. Uh, the first is the block store proposal that um, we're building for Harvard Lab Exchange in collaboration with edX. And this is about creating a new way to store content on the Open edX platform. Uh, we have this proposal on the architecture space where you can read through some of the ideas that we have and uh, some of the goals we want to achieve with it. But basically, uh, today we have the situation on the left where uh, course content is stored in module store in, in courses and uh, is closely integrated with the X block runtime. And we want to move to a more flexible way of storing content, which you can see on the right, which is the, going to be called block store. And we're hoping that this new architecture will better separate out different components like tagging, like the Xbox runtime, course structure, and content. And by separating those things, allow uh, new opportunities like flexible learning experiences, adaptive learning, and content reuse. So uh, I don't have time to get into the details of Blockstore today. Um, and nor is there any code for it yet, but we're very interested in hearing uh, people's use cases and, and uh, feedback on where we're going with this. So please take a look at the proposal on the wiki. Um, it's also linked to from the OEP pull requests uh, on the OEP's uh, GitHub page. And if we have any time later, um, we can talk more about it. Yeah, I think we should probably reserve block block some time in a future edition to go over this, especially after you've gotten uh, some initial uh, code review uh, out the door. Um, that, would be, that would be cool. Sounds good. All right, awesome. Uh, Any other? Second, yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah, the second one is uh, work we've been doing for Australian National University to improve the uh, problem response reports in the instructor dashboard. So that's uh, this little section here of the instructor dashboard. One one of the improvements that is currently under review is uh, creating a UI that lets you, instead of having to go through the LMS and find a block ID and then paste it in here, we now have this UI that lets you just browse through the course tree like this and pick the component that you want, or even a whole section of the course, which is previously not supported. And we've also improved that report. Um, so here, you can see the old report just had two columns, username and state, and the new one includes username, title, location in the course, question, and student answer in a readable form instead of the JSON blob that you used to see. Um, and finally, we've also added a CSV viewer to the platform so that you can view those instructor reports uh, without having to download them and then fire up Excel. So here you can see a, a preview of that showing a CSV directly in your browser. Uh, some of this work has merged and some of it is still under review. And okay. then last but not least, I just wanted to mention our recent work on X-Block internationalization. Cool. Uh, until earlier this year when we did this work, uh, it wasn't possible for X-Blocks to uh, translate the text that they had in their HTML templates or in their JavaScript files. And so we've added, we've merged pull requests that implement both of those things. So now if your X-Block uses Django templates or um, has strings defined in the JavaScript code, you can use uh, what's documented here uh, under the development page. There's a subpage that has all the uh, work that we did there. 
And now X blocks can be fully internationalized with their own uh, string files. Cool. Awesome. Nice book, man. Oh. Um, any, okay, Is, uh, were those the things that you wanted to go over? Yep, those, those are the three things I was gonna cover. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks for all your work, Braden. Uh, just make sure that all the links on the um, uh, all the links on the uh, agenda page are updated. To, to I think they they are. Just you know, double check them. Uh, any questions for Braden before before we move on? Okay. All right. Cool. Um, let's see. All right. So next on the agenda, uh, so we have is Jeremy Jeremy Bowman here. Yep. I'm here. Ah. <laughs> Somebody needs to mute. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you great, thank you. <laughs> so, actually, let's see if I can. Is there no feedback if I'm doing it this way? There is no feedback. Good, okay, so I can actually hear if there's any questions. <laughs> um, so, I've got an item in here called the Incremental Improvements Project. Uh, this is something that came out of the work we were doing on the Django 111 upgrade, which ended up being a lot of work from a very small number of people within edX with some contributions from the rest of edX and the community. And we decided that moving forward, we need to do things like the upgrade to Python 3 and some other large like, across the code base cleanup would like to do, but that just wasn't a sustainable way to do it. And we've also kept hearing from the community that people would like to contribute more and from new people to the community that, like, hey, I'd like to find a way to contribute, but I don't know where to start, what's a good starting ticket. So we're trying to address all of these issues with this incremental improvements project. So the idea is, the way it's structured right now is that we have a JIRA project, which has currently one epic in it for the Python 3 upgrade. And there are rules for what kind of tickets can go into that project. Namely, that it has to be something with no prerequisites, so you can start on immediately. It has to be something that we believe to be a relatively small chunk of work and that it doesn't require a large amount of domain experience with the OpenEdX code base and other criteria like this, such that effectively anyone in the OpenEdX community can pick one of these tickets, start working on it, and making a meaningful contribution just within a couple of hours or so. And that project is already there. We have the existing Epic for the Python 3 upgrade for edX platform. We plan to add some more Epics in there for other projects that can benefit from distributed development like this and would love to hear from people on, is this going to work organizationally for people? Is this a good enough way of finding what needs to be done? Are there any obstacles people have towards actually contributing this way and accommodating and getting feedback? And would like to try this out and see if it'll actually work for everyone. So there's a draft OEP up, OEP 25 for this. It's in a pull request that's linked in from the agenda. And any comments you have, I can either like, take some questions now, or you can also review the OEP and comment on there. Um, but I'd love to get feedback on this and make sure this actually works for everyone, and hopefully we can make progress on some of these larger uh, projects. Peter's asking, what's the Jira URL? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Just put it in the page. Yeah. All right, so you're gonna, you're gonna update the page with the Jira URL? Yeah, Ned said he was just adding it to the page. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you, Ned. Awesome. Yeah, so if, if people haven't noticed, uh, because our, confer our <laughs> conference room situation is as it is, uh, it's difficult to get the uh, webcam to, to broadcast Zoom correctly. So they're all in a room trading microphones and videos and trying not to, uh, <laughs> trying not to get feedback if they both have their microphones on. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll We'll deal, and hopefully next time we'll have a smoother uh, experience. But um, okay, any uh, any other questions for Jeremy? What about um, what about Django two? You mentioned Python three. Yeah, so Django two actually drops support for Python two, so we have to do the Python three upgrade first. Got it. Now, okay. hopefully, you know, we will get at a point in the Python three upgrade where enough of it is done that we probably could start testing. And go to with it and we're definitely setting up talks and Jenkins and everything to be able to do that but in terms of priority we need to make progress on the Python 3 upgrade before we can really start on the Django 2. Okay. The one thing we can do right now and that we've already 
made some progress on the previous hackathon is we have a long list of tickets that are cleanup work of things that we had code the way it is because it had to work that way in earlier versions of Django, but now there's a new way that already works as of 111, and the old way will stop working in Django 2. And those are things we can do immediately, and it'll actually clean up a lot of warnings for us in our test runs. Okay. And it's entirely possible that some of those may migrate over to a new epic in the incremental improvements project, um, but we're just trying to keep it like relatively focused for the time being on the higher priority things. But if we hear from people that there's other things that other goals that people would like to move towards, we would like to create more uh, epics in there so that progress can move forward on those also. This, this sounds uh, great and kind of solves a you know, known problem for these things that you know, clearly infrastructure uh, building uh, you know, projects, core pieces like you know, Python 3 uh, and Django 2 migration. These are sort of things that can be done distributed and, and distributed way and hopefully collaboratively. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the response is from the community on that. So thanks. Um, all right, anything else on that, Jeremy? Mm, nope. Okay. That's about it. Okay, cool. All right. Again, so, love to hear feedback from people. All right. Okay, moving right along. Um, okay. Oh, wow. People have been editing away at the agenda page. Thank you. Uh, okay, anything else on? All right, so Omar, are you here? Uh, sorry, this is Valerie Pierre from Appam Assembler. Actually, Omar couldn't join, I think. Um, so I guess maybe uh, you'll have to pass on it on this one. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is anyone else here that can talk about friends of Open edX? Um Actually, yeah, you had a question about that. So he asked me if I could relay his question. Okay. Um, that's um, essentially, yeah, we saw that this was created after the conference. That's awesome. Uh, I think it was, it was discussed in the conference. And we were wondering who was the owner for this and what the plan how we can contribute there we'd love to upload some yeah i think that was done basically by uh, yeah when they were talking about in montreal it was kind of discussion between uh the fun the fun people i think pierre you may have been involved in those discussions uh yes, talking yes about, i was yes so well, but I, don't the, know, I don't know who actually created that <laughs> project i, I think, think it was the fun people the people from fun but yeah, uh, yeah, it, I did. it's mainly your Oh, Samuel, you're there. You can go, go ahead, Sam. Sam. Yeah, I, I created the, the, um, the organization on GitHub, and today it's uh, Robert from Edulib and myself uh, are the owners. Okay. And, and basically, we, I think uh, any organization that wants to contribute can get uh, an admin uh, account on this. Uh, Organizations, that's the idea. There's, there's not, nothing much we, we thought about. Uh, and basically, what, I can, what else I can say is that we have started work with Edulib on the portal project. So we, we collaborate with uh, Sophia Mayo, David Chong, and uh, Robert. And we, we, we started collaboration on, on this project. So that's, that's the first repository that will be put to this organization in the coming days. Yeah, and and we have well, um, yeah, and Edix is also following uh, this closely because uh, Dave Onsby is also part of these meetings. Okay, so that that's the first like my first lab of friends of Open Edix with a a project. So I think we, there's been discussions about the Docker efforts, but. Some people who like Regis was really not okay with this, so we dropped the project. We we won't work on Friends of Open Edix for Docker. So basically, so far everyone stays on side on Docker. And okay. Any any other project can start using it if there's a if it brings something, but we we don't have too much ambition. We we <laughs> try to be pragmatic. We we just try to be pragmatic and see who who can work together and who doesn't want and just do it. It's just a tool, it's just a tool to share the repository and say, I don't have a hand on this repo, I can I'm okay to to share the the, the power and to <laughs> discuss and try to have to collaborate. That's just a, this kind of tool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know that um, in Montreal you guys are talking about starting with the 
portal project, uh, but there is some discussion about other things going there too. Um, it can be a way for, you know, related projects related to OpenEdX that aren't core projects. Um, it can be a way for them to get started and maybe accumulate interest and, and get some traction. And then eventually, who knows, maybe some of those things will become part of the you know, core OpenEdX uh, distribution. But, um, but I think it's a great way for this kind of uh, orthogonal or related uh, uh, related uh, development to, you know, to get going and, and get some get some interest. So thank you for starting it. Uh, there's a question from Al Valerie about who should uh, who should they contact to get an admin account? Like, who controls that? So for the moment, it's me or uh, Robert. So okay. we can do admin access to AppAssembler. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. That sounds great. Okay. Um, all right. So that's Friends of OpenEdX. So that's one of the things that came out of the kind of developer summit in Montreal. I'm really glad to see people uh, follow up on that. And in general, uh, anything else that you guys want to follow up with regarding the developer summit? You're more than welcome to bring up here, or the next one, or or in whatever uh, venue uh, you know you deem appropriate. Um, okay, so today's uh, demo, uh, the uh, the primary demo, that the one that I, I wanted to make sure we had time to uh, have, was uh, from Louise at uh, IBM. Louise, are you are you on? Yep. Yeah, I'm here, John. Excellent. Okay. Do you need to share your screen or anything? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna share. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'll stop sharing mine. Show some stuff. Um, start. All right. You can see. You can see. Cool. So, uh, first of all, a bit of introduction because I, I don't know if uh, everyone knows me. I'm not very active in the <laughs> in the community, unfortunately. But, uh, but that's going to change, right? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> okay. I, think I try to be more involved. Uh, as we go, but uh, as John mentioned, I'm a software engineer here at IBM. Uh, we run the website called Cognitive Class, uh, which provides online courses on data science, machine learning, big data, all this kind of stuff. And we've been working for OpenEdX about two years now, um, a little bit more actually. And we have, uh, during the Montreal conference, we mentioned that we deploy OpenEdX with Docker uh, a lot. And people got interested in how we do it. So uh, John suggested that I show you guys more details here. Um, so during one of the presentations, uh, my manager showed a little bit of how the deployments work, uh, but it was very high level. So in here, I'm going to try to go deeper uh, into the technical details. Uh, so if you watch the presentation, he showed that everything starts with the GitHub issue. So whenever we have let's say the business people want a new deployment. Uh, they go into our repository here, create an issue. We have a template here uh, where they just need to fill out some details. Uh, oh, just uh, information like we call our uh, deployments, private deployments portals. So everywhere is a portal, think of uh, open edX deployment. Uh, so they just need to fill out a little bit, you know, details about the portal. So for example, the name, uh, let's go back to me the URL that they, they want to access. Uh, we do support like custom domains with this, uh, so they can specify to host on their own domain or, can use, or they can use our, our domain and have them as subdomain. So it would be something like acme.cognitiveglass.ai or something like that. Uh, it's up to, to the customer. Uh, we deploy in several data centers, so you need to choose like the location. Say Toronto, because that's where I'm located. And there's some extra information about, you know, if it's something important, when do you need buy, and who to contact uh, if you need more information. So once this issue is generated, uh, you submit the issue. This is going to trigger a alert on the developer stack saying, "Hey, somebody's requesting deployment." And basically, the deployer, uh, developer can go and assign the issue to themselves, meaning I'll be responsible for managing this deployment. And from then on, everything's automated. So uh, all the developer has to do is to open the portal deployments repository. Uh, and in here, uh, there's a portals folder where 
all of the portals that we have deployed and all the environments that we have are there. And let me actually open this sample. So they need to create a file in there uh, to describe the portal. So the default is basically just choose the name of the portal. So it's a very simple uh, variable that you need to set. But for example, for a hostel, a hosted deployment, you need to choose the domain and some other extra configurations uh, like the DNS settings and all of that. Um, but I think I have an ACME, yeah. So oops, we don't need this. So basically what a developer needs to do is create this uh, variables file, specify some settings, and then kick off the Ansible playbook. So this, I was very uh, curious about the, the deployment that fun guys did because it's very similar to what we did. Uh, so that was pretty curious. Uh, so once you create this variable, you just need to run the playbook. Oh. Oops. I don't know how to increase the font here, but I uh, hope it's legible. Uh, you just need to run the playbook. It's gonna ask some stuff, like basic information, uh, like the portal slug, which is like the name of the portal. Uh, I already have an icon, so I'm gonna create an icon too now. And then the environment where you want to run. And this will kick off the, oops. Uh, oh, I forgot to, should be collected. Again. And then it's gonna run the playbook and just basically. Uh, oh yeah, I have a check for uh, if the repository is up to date, which mine's not. But anyway, this will automate the deployment of the portal using Ansible. Uh, and once it's done running, you have a full running portal uh, for you. Cool. Uh, so that's the process that runs. Uh, so everything basically is automated. You just need to run one command and you have an open index deployment. Now behind the scenes, what we have is, and I hope this works, let me start the portal. Can you, uh, hope you're still seeing, uh, but our infrastructure, we have multiple hosts. So these are just normal VMs uh, on the cloud that we have. And then inside each host, we have several containers that are responsible for different services. So for example, I have a container for LMS, a container for CMS, for LMS workers, uh, for running database migration, for compiling assets, all these kind of individual services and tasks that need to be done. Uh, they're all containerized. And on top of all these containers, we have Rancher, uh, which is responsible for orchestrating the container uh, assignment, so assigning so which host to run the container, and also responsible for things like uh, traffic routing, so load balancing, uh, host networks, so, all, so there's a private network uh, across hosts that Rancher manages, and this kind of things. What, what we also have, is a NFS volume that is mounted across all the hosts. So this is so that we don't have to, to rely on local file storage and the containers can come up and down in different hosts and the data will still be there uh, for the container. So we don't, we don't lose information if a container is scheduled to a different host. Now, inside of the NFS, we have a file structure that looks a little bit like this. Uh, we have a root volume our root uh, folder where each portal gets another folder inside. And then inside each portal, we have uh, the Ansible overrides file, which is probably one of the most important files that we have. Um, and we also store things that should be persisted, such as, um, so the virus folder are like data that needs to be persisted across runs. So things like, uh, database information, uh, logs, uh, compile assets, things like this, uh, goes to the var folder. Now, all of these folders, they are mounted into different containers. Uh, so for example, the Ansible overrides are stored uh, in these containers. Uh, just another quick note, we call our deployments portals. So a lot of our services are related to the portals game. So Gladys is the robot uh, in the game. Um, but anyway, it's a minor detail. Uh, so this file is mounted into multiple containers and then they can read from that. Uh, 
Uh, we also have a special mount for GLaDOS because GLaDOS is the admin interface. So that's where the OpenEdX, uh, so whoever is managing the OpenEdX instance, uh, instance, they need to go and configure uh, that instance, like changing the logo, changing the name, changing like the manuals and stuff like this. Uh, is all done on GLaDOS. And because of that, GLaDOS needs to be able to write to the file, and that's how you propagate setting changes from the user to the OpenEdX instance. <clears throat> so uh, the way it works is that whenever the LMS starts, it's going to run the, Ansible, uh, the normal Ansible playbook from the configurations repository, like we didn't change that. But the only thing we change is that we also read this as overrides variables. Uh, and then they are added to the, to the JSON file at the end. So that's how we work. That's how we manage uh, the configurations that need to be applied to the open edX. Louise, you still there? Louise? Yeah, so I, uh, Louise, if you're, hang on, I'm gonna try to get him on chat. All right, we'll see if. <laughs> Just send him a private message. Louise, if you can hear us, we cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, hello. Sorry, oh. my, my Zoom crashed. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I can, I can still uh, see your screen, though. Oh. Uh, weird. Let me. Yeah, that's not the right thing. Hang on a second. Um, how long have I been speaking to myself? It was about one minute. Okay. <laughs> I think it was when I changed screen here on the... Okay. For some reason, I cannot start, you cannot start sharing. Oh. It looks as if I'm still sharing, but it's not yeah. actually. Oh, okay. Um, Let me try this. And I'm trying to like take over. Hang on a second. Yeah, it's not allowing me to share. Hang on a second. I'm gonna try to take over and then. Uh... Okay. So I'm gonna. Hang on. Then... Okay, so I started sharing. So now, Luigi, you should not be sharing, right? Um, and I want to stop. Oh, I'm still viewing your screen. <laughs> yeah, that's super weird. So maybe let me try leave the meeting and come back again. Let's see. Yeah, I'm let's right. let's try that. Right back. Oh yeah, I see you're listed twice. Hang on a second. Um, Okay, I think now it should work. Yeah, I see one of you now. Okay, is it working now? I can see your screen, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. Cool. Um, okay, so let me go back here. So the so I was talking about all the Ansible Override YAML file that we use for uh, passing changes from the user to the open edX instance. And now I'm showing the Docker entry point that we have, uh, which is kind of convoluted, but the main interesting part is that we run the, the playbook, like the normal edX app playbook uh, that is part of the configuration repo. We didn't change that. Uh, we do run some specific tags, so it doesn't run for too long, but you know, it's 
it's just a minor detail, but the important part is that we pass the Ansible overrides here. So all the variables that, <clears throat> that we set the file are used to override some of the settings that are default on the instance. So uh, whatever is set on the, the, on the uh, default for the role, uh, we override here uh, based on the user input. input. Uh, when this playbook finishes running, it generates the JSON file that we are all familiar with, and then you know, open that read from there, and that's all it does. Uh, another interesting thing about this entry point that we created is that it's actually the same image uh, can be executed with several commands, and this will generate different uh, response. So if you run with the CMS command, it's gonna start the CMS uh, app, uh, same for the LMS, and then we have assets for pre-compiling, uh, config, you would just run the playbook uh, and render the JSON file, basically. Uh, migration is gonna run database migrations, the workers uh, will start the LMS and the CMS workers. Uh, the init is just, just gonna run some specific things we do for a portal, such as configuring both clients uh, and other things that we do specifically for, for our deployments. Uh, so our image kind of flexible in that way that we can specify a command and it will do a different response based on that. Uh, okay, so after all this is done uh, and the script finishes running, it's gonna create something in Rancher like this. Uh, so in Rancher Lingo, this is called a stack. And it's very similar to, if you're familiar with Docker Compose, a composition, uh, because inside of the stack, you have several services. And inside of services, you have multiple containers. So this is a list of containers for a service. Let me actually increase, I'm not sure you can read properly. Uh, so let me go into stack and show just so here you can see familiar faces like CMS, CMS workers, forum, uh, the LMS, LMS workers, and then memcache, Mongo, MySQL. So this is all part of the portal. So each OpenNX deployment has their own, basically everything, everything's packaged uh, into, into themselves. And we also have this thing that we call the ops service. Uh, this is where we have you know, operations that we need to run from time to time. Uh, so these are containers that are not running all the time. They're just running where they're needed. Uh, so for example, backups, we have a cron job that triggers these things from time to time. Uh, it's hard to read, but we have the migrations uh, that are run once when the port is deployed or whenever you know, there's an update and we need to run the migrations again. We can just come here and just press the start button to restart the container. So let's say that I want to run a backup. I just come here, press play, and this will trigger a backup uh, to be run. Um, so this is a nice way to organize and also a nice way to, to manually fix stops when they're broken. So what, like sometimes the assets uh, cache get invalidated, we need to recreate them, we can just go here and start the container and this will generate the assets. Um, so this is a nice, nice thing we have. So, so after the portal is up and running, it looks a little bit like this. Uh, actually, let me go to the little bit like this. Uh, we decided not to change open edX as much as we could. So that's why our UI looks a lot like the open edX UI, not the other way around because uh, we had a lot of issues with our public websites trying to maintain the visual stuff similar. So we thought it would be easier for us to mimic than to <laughs> try to mimic the, to make, to make OpenEdX mimic uh, whatever design we came up. So this is a, the compare bones, there are no content here. In order to do that, the admin would go to the admin page, which is what I was calling Gladys before. Uh, that's how it looks like. And in here you can customize the OpenX deployment. Uh, you can give it a title for the heading, a subtitle, the welcome page. So this is more like an easy content management sort of thing uh, that whoever managers can do that. And, 
And as I mentioned, everything that, so for example, let me try to do a side by side. So whenever a, I just open the LMS. So let's say I come here and we have the header menu here. So we can add items to the header menu here. And it also, uh, so this is the open X part. Uh, it's also show the same menu items on the open X. So uh, someone can come here and just like points to add X. And, so whenever I click this button, what it's gonna do is it's gonna create a new menu item. And you see on the left here, uh, that is triggering a restart on the LMS to apply the change. So what happened was Gladys, I should not change the screen again so I don't break stuff. Uh, let me. Uh oh, I think we lost him again. All right, um, looks like when you switch the screens, uh, Zoom crashes, which is uh, a good thing to keep in mind. Sorry, you have been again. Yeah, no worries. When you, when you, whenever you do a lot of screen switching, it's yeah. going to crash. Yeah. So, so we had a question um, about uh, what's this, what CMS are you using and how much of this code is available to, you know, uh, for everyone to use? Right, so the CMS we're using, it's not something we, we built. Uh, it's not, like in our public website, we use WordPress. Yeah. Uh, but for this one, it was very specific to, to our needs. Like uh, there's a lot of specific things that we had to do. So we created okay. our own CMS. Uh, the second question, nothing is open source yet because it's, it's kind of messy right now, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there's not much documentation around, so. At this point, open sourcing will be very, uh, very tricky. Okay, so and so not, not very useful. To, so you to guys know. built it from scratch. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Projects. Um. So you didn't use like WordPress or anything to, or Django to, to uh, CMS to start it off. No, no, it's a Rogue and Rails project. Uh, but that's basically it. everything else is built from scratch. Oh wow. Okay. Uh. So I'm having the same issue. Can you kick? Okay, what do you need me to do? Kick the other, the other Luis from. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, are, there are two of you. Um, yeah, and I'll try to, to I thought I had the PowerPoint in the right. Okay, the right. so I think the question is which Luis do I? Uh, so I'm gonna keep talking, and then you can see that. Ah, yeah. Okay. Microphone. So I know. I know. I know which one. To... Which one to kick? Yep. Let's see. It's hit the uh, and it didn't do anything. Yeah, it's not letting me. It's not oh. letting me remove you. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's weird. That's weird. Um, well, hang on. Well, tell you what. Um, oh, there you go. I think it worked. Okay. Now, now, now you're. Now I see you. Okay. So let me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna avoid spaces. Hopefully, Mac is not gonna delete automatically. But uh, so I was showing that whenever I save here, you saw the restart. This is because we need to re-trigger that Ansible playbook from running to generate the JSON configuration file. Uh, so the value that I set here generated a configuration in that YAML variables file. And then we, re we use the Ranger API to restart the containers and this will regenerate the JSON. And then when I actually go to the, the instance, uh, I can see the new uh, menu item here. So, so this is one thing we change it on the theme. So we have a open index theme that reads that variable to generate the menu items at the top. Yeah. Uh, same for the, to the footer, thing like that. Uh, so 
that's how that's about it for the docker uh, yeah. let me see if there are questions but the, um so it's docker but it's specific to the rancher uh ui and implementation right i mean yeah yeah like we did i didn't do much work on the docker part basically yeah. like i run the ansible uh stuff there so mm -hmm. it's not like the the fungi are Reggie's actually yeah. uh, created a much better image. So my my homework is actually to try his image to see how, how it works for us. Uh, Great. But I haven't done that yet. But I hope that that will be good and we can you know stop reinventing the wheel every time and just. <laughs> also, uh, yeah. a question from Ned: uh, Could you use the powered by OpenEdX uh, logo on your on your site? Yeah. So that's. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely checked with my manager. There was a, we used to have it and then, and then they, they asked us to change and then it's actually customizable right now. Yeah. Uh, the, the footer. Uh, but yeah, we, we need to, to figure out exactly how, how, how many, that will work. Uh, how many sites are you running? Like how many OpenEdX sites are you running? Uh, we have, I think currently we have about 30 running uh, okay. but a lot of them are just for like you know more like testing like you know we want to show yeah. the customers what we have so we deploy one then they will might come up and down uh, and they need but right now it's about 30 websites can you can you share like how many learners <laughs> and educators you support on your infrastructure uh so on this one there are a lot of them are smaller instances, uh, yeah. just because they're more tests. So probably like tens of students on each, hundreds of students maximum okay. on each. Okay. Right. Uh, on our public website, so the public website doesn't use any of this because this is all new. Oh, okay. uh, the public website, we don't use Docker, we use the normal native deployment. Got it. Uh, and in there we have almost a million students right now. Uh, okay. But in there, we use the normal, you know, we have VMs, we use Ansible to configure them. So this the normal native deployment. Okay. So um, this was, we used Docker for this because we needed a more dynamic and <clears throat> streamlined process to deploy. Yeah. Uh, and Docker was just easier. Okay. What, so when I went through your site, I noticed you had like a, a nice little lab section, um, you know, the labs that are the lab component to the mm -hmm. courses that you offer. And I noticed a lot of them, you have some nice, uh, you've done some nice, I guess, interface work so that the uh, Docker images are, you know, accessible via the, like the web page, like where the, um, they just kind of pop into the web page. I was wondering if you could spend two minutes talking about how you did that. Sure. So that one is, it's actually a separate service that we offer. Uh, uh -huh. We call the Cognitive call Class Labs. So yeah. If you go to labs.cognitive.ai. Right. Uh, <clears throat> It's a full different service uh, that we have. And the idea here is to give students a online space where they can learn, you know, mostly like data science things or programming yeah. things. And we have a set, set of tools that, that are available like online for the students. Uh -huh. uh, and then they just can launch it to this. So in the back end, uh, it's gonna start a Docker container with the lab. Yeah. And pop up the tool and we actually persist the files. So whatever file you create is going to be there when you start. So it's not just a throwaway thing. Right. Uh, and essentially what we do in our courses is the, the easiest way is just an iframe basically. <laughs> so we iframe oh, okay. this. Okay. So we created, an, it's a little bit more than this. Uh, we create an X block that one loads the all the files that are required. So for example, if the lab uses a Python notebook, uh, it loads the notebook into the student's, called a workbench. Uh, so it loads the file into the student's workbench and then creates a nice frame opening the specific file for the course. Got it. Uh, I can actually show, yeah, there's a question about the labs. Uh, I can actually show for people that haven't seen it. Um, yeah, yeah, so you mentioned the Xbox. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, an X block means that you'll like <laughs> post it uh, somewhere in GitHub. Yeah, I can 
do that. It doesn't do much. No. <laughs> Again, it just up, uploads the file and then opens the, the iframe. Uh, okay. So, so the experience for the user, just so someone is not familiar with. Uh, so this is our public website. Anyone have access to that? It's just going to blast.ai. Uh, and for the student's perspective, we can just come here, click Start Lab. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, it's going to upload the file and then open the night frame to the to our lab service that uh, opens the, the okay. lab right there for them. Got it. Okay. Great. Yeah, okay, so we're kind of we're kind of coming up at the end of the time. Um, yep. We have about two minutes left. Does anybody have any uh, questions for Louise uh, that hasn't already been asked? Feel free to take yourself off mute if you want to ask. If there are no questions, there's another thing that came up during the conference, which was how we manage courses. So we publish courses ourselves and we allow other instances to download our courses on their own open edX instance. Uh, and this is done on the admin interface as well. So here in the courses, uh, they'll have full access to our catalog. So this is a staging, that's why the courses are not very real. Uh, but but the way it works here is that we just can come here, get, uh, and the course will show up on their, uh, on their instance, on their open edX instance. Uh, so I have a service, the backend that stores all the course content. So whenever a course author creates a course, they can export it for GC. Uh, and then we have a service that is a course catalog where they upload there. And essentially what the portal is doing is downloading that RGZ. Uh, and installing on the instance. Cool. All right. Thanks. I think that's all the time we have for today. If there's anything else you want to follow cool. up with, uh, we can have that at the at the next hangout. Um, cool. In the meantime, if we didn't have time to get to you today for show and tell, we can uh, move it to next month. So again, we're trying to hit the second Thursday uh, of every month. So if you uh, if you have something, I don't. I forget exactly what day that is in the calendar, but I, I will update the uh, the wiki tomorrow with, with the pertinent information uh, around the date and time uh, and kind of the, the starting uh, subjects, which I'll basically just move from the June agenda to the July agenda. Uh, okay, so thanks. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, uh, Jeremy and uh, Julio uh, and everybody else uh, who contributed today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Namisha, Ned. Uh, and uh, look forward to next time. Uh, the recording should be up on the YouTube channel uh, by tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.